The first thing that comes to mind when I think of TV is contagious. Unknowingly, they have it and like they just creating the disease without knowing. The first thing that I think of when I hear uh, TB, um, it's coughing. Frias. First uh, thing I I think about when I hear the word TB is I get scary. The first thing that I think is about when I hear the word TB, that's the first thing that I think of when I hear the that's all what I think. And the first thing which comes to my mind when I think of the word TB is a deadly flu. So when they are put in hospital, then most of the family members do not come and visit them. Struggle. First thing that comes to mind when I think about TV is danger. But nowadays people just think if someone has TV, they got AIDS. Because of all the stigma around TV. So TB continues to be the top infectious killer worldwide, claiming 4,500 lives a day. Despite it being largely treatable, TB is the top cause of natural death in South Africa. According to the World Health Organization, it killed an estimated 124,000 South Africans in 2016 alone. Now, about 454,000 in South Africa developed active TB disease each year, and of these, 57%, or if you like, 258,000 are HIV positive. It also est estimated that about 80% of the population of South Africa is infected with TB, the vast majority of whom have la latent TB rather than active TB. Now, healthcare workers are said to be at increased risk of acquiring TB in settings where they are systematically exposed to both undiagnosed and diagnosed TB patients. Now, each year we commemorate World TB Day on March the 24th to raise public awareness about the devastating health, social, and economic consequences of TB, and to set up efforts to end the global TB epidemic. Now, the theme for World TB in 2018 was Wanted, Leaders for a TB-Free World. So our topic for today then is TB, with a little bit of emphasis on its effect on healthcare work workers. Now, to help us unpack this, we have an expert panel comprised of the Director for Drug-Resistant TB, TB and HIV from the National Department of Health. We have also a specialist physician, an advisor from Right to Care, and a representative from Hospesa. And joining us from our Devon studios, we'll have a healthcare worker that is a survivor of MDR TB. Now, be part of the show by asking the panel some questions or simply just sharing your views with us. In that case, the number to call is Johannesburg 714 6918 or 6919. You can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. So sit back, relax, and learn from this bumper show ahead. Come to, coming to you just after a short break. I'm Dr. Salom Mittaum, and this is Health Talk. MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. After a horrific accident, major questions were asked. So step one, I, was, I asked myself, do I really want to die? And my answer to that was, I'm not sure. And then step two was, do I want my parents to bury me? And the answer to that was no. Learning kept his brain in full action on how the brain works. When I was in hospital, right, as I was saying to catch up with my peers, I started to become obsessed with memory techniques and how the brain works and how we retain information. Touching lives is his continuous mission. I now work for a non-profit where we deal with access issues regarding uh, kids with disabilities and persons with disability. We're busy working on beach access. Being wheelchair-bound did not stop fun in his life. I party in a wheelchair, I laugh in a wheelchair, I smile in a wheelchair. For all your uplifting stories, catch Bupilong every Friday. SABCnews.com is your one-stop digital portal to all the news you need. With a website that is easy to use on mobile, 
SABC News prides itself in being the primary source of public service content across multiple platforms. Watch live streams of all the big news events on the SABC News YouTube channel, which is one of the most viewed South African YouTube channels globally. And catch up on the best of SABC television and radio news. Follow breaking news on all of the SABC News social media platforms, interact with SABC News on Facebook, and stay connected on Twitter for the latest headlines and real-time updates by our reporters. SABC News, everywhere. Shield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. Special assignment. Crime keeps the society in terror and pain. Why so? If, if someone phones me, this phones me, tells me, okay, okay, I need a silver. And I get your driving, I'll take it. What pushes normal people to be so hard, heartless, and brutally kill one another? The other side of it could be more for their own psychological need. Uh, it might be part of a sexual fantasy that they have. Uh, it could be about power and control. After proper investigation is followed, the perpetrator gets arrested. There is quite a massive process. And I think we do it to our it's just as he said. Emotional scars remain. We would pay any price to get him back. And the sad reality is that it's, it's gone. Special assignment. We unravel the truth every Sunday at 21.30. I'm a medical doctor specialised in paediatrics and infectious diseases. Shortly after graduating as a medical doctor, I was working at a very busy day hospital, seeing up to 50 patients a day, many of whom we diagnosed with TB. Although we'd had lectures about the risk of acquiring TB, um, I was naive. I thought I was young and healthy and fit and that I was at low risk for TB or any disease for that matter. And so I didn't really put much thought into protecting myself. 
for a couple of weeks, I didn't really acknowledge that something was wrong. Um, I started coughing more and more. Um, I had definitely lost some weight. Shortly thereafter, we got the results that it was drug susceptible TB. I took treatment for six months. Um, I had some nausea, a lot of skin itchiness, which drove me crazy um, for the full six months. I was booked off work for at least two weeks, which put a lot of extra strain on my colleagues, but I had no choice at that stage. The surprise was the reaction of my family members, who obviously were concerned for my health, but were quite cross with me for not having gone to get it checked out and get a diagnosis sooner. And, and certainly there were even some friends that didn't come round to visit as often as they used to. And yes, so there was definitely stigma. After starting treatment, it was at least two months before I was back to my normal self. I had been in a relationship with my now husband at that stage already for six years. So fortunately, I had someone to support me through the diagnosis and the experience and make sure that I finished my treatment. For a long time, we've lived in denial. And I think a lot of that is due to the stigma that healthcare workers are still faced with in disclosing when they've actually become sick from TB. It's really an underreported phenomenon in this country and probably others in Africa as well. Another really key development for the prevention of TB would be a new TB vaccine. That really would be a major breakthrough that if at population level we could somehow immunize against TB, we would really be able to break the cycle of transmission of TB in our communities. Infection control in general, um, but particularly TB infection control, are fairly neglected areas of healthcare. And I think the more attention and resources that we can divert to preventing TB acquisition, both in the community and in our healthcare facilities, the better. start at the very basics. We, we, we're trying to understand what this TV is. And to help us understand that, I have an expert panel. And let's start with the gentleman closest to me. This is Dr. Jafet Manda, who's a specialist physician based out at um, the Tsilo Hospital in Pretoria. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you, and uh, good morning to the viewers. All right. And then next to Dr. Manda in the middle, we have Dr. Norbert Njeka. Now, Dr. Njeka is the director for drug-resistant TB and MDR-TB within the National Department of Health. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you, thank you. All right. And last but not least yeah. is Dr. Um, Tandi Zamini Miti. Now, Dr. Zamini Miti is the um, drug-resistant TB technical advisor for Right to Care. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Tandi. Thank you, and morning to the listeners. All right. We seem to have had a, a slight technical uh, glitch there with our sound, but I think we, we're ready to go. Now, perhaps let me start with you, Dr. Manda. Um, we're talking TB. Yes. What is TB in sim simple terms? Okay. TB is a bacterial disease which has existed since uh, prehistoric times. It is caused by a bacteria called mycobacteria tuberculosis. For the purposes of this discussion, we will restrict our discussion to mycobacteria tuberculosis, which causes infection in human beings. There's also mycobacterium bovis, which causes bovine TB, yeah. and other less relevant mycobacterium, like mycobacterium africanum, yeah. caprium, uh, etc. But so, so there's different different mycobacterium okay, types uh, species. Of TB as, as, as it, or species yes. that cause cause tuberculosis. Yes. Okay. How much of a problem is it in South Africa? But let, let me ask Dr. Jack. I mean, from a, from the Department of Health's perspective, I know that you know you focus a lot more on MDR TB, but generally TB in general, we we, we can get to MDR TB in, in in a little while. But generally TB. Yeah, TB is a, is a big problem. We are a high burden TB country, high burden HIV and high burden MDR TB at the same time. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, estimates that 1% uh, of the South African population develop TB 
active tuberculosis every year. Yeah. Uh, and that translates to something like half a million people each and every year. And 2% of those have MDR-TB um, among the new cases and uh, up to 7% among the retreatment. So we, we do, but in terms of our treatment register, uh, recently we've been uh, um, uh, enrolling up to 300,000 or 290,000 susceptible TB for treatment mm. every year mm. and 12,000 MDR and XDR TB per year. So that's of the recent past three years. Okay. I, I think for the purposes of our viewers, uh, I mean, we, we throw these terms around MDRTB, XDRTB. Can you perhaps just explain what these mean? Yeah. The MDRTB is the commonest drug resistant tuberculosis. This is a, a form of tuberculosis uh, that uh, have, uh, give, transmit strains that are resistant to the. The, the strongest medicine that are used to treat tuberculosis, that are rifampicin and isoniazide, that is MDRTB. And then X, XDRTB, uh, MDRTB is multi drug resistant tuberculosis. XDRTB is extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. The, the, the people who have that form of tuberculosis have a strain that is resistant to rifampicin, isoniazide, and uh, other second line. Uh, agents that are used in the treatment. So that's a severe form linked to thigh mortality, uh, but uh, fortunately maybe it's fewer. Like I said, you get uh, only 600 and the susceptible TB is 300,000, mm -hmm. but there's still uh, a lot of people who have yeah. this that really have uh, bad, uh, bad outcomes in terms of mortality. Okay. D Dr. Tandy, I mean, you, you the drug-resistant TB technical advisor for right to care. Mm -hmm. Firstly, just tell us what that means, you know, what role you play actually at right to care, and, and, and give us your perspective of resistant TB that you come across. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the technical advisor, we basically offer technical assistance to different levels of uh, Department of Health. We do work closely with Dr. Njeka at the National Department of Health. We also do work with provincial department. We also work with districts and also directly uh, offering uh, direct service delivery also at the facilities. So there are different things we advise. So most of it, the technical assistance will be mentoring clinicians, training on certain things like the drug resistant TB, you know, there have been new regimens, there have been new developments that have been coming up. So our role has been, you know, spreading the word awareness and also training on drug resistance, how to manage it, and also assessing facilities in terms of, you know, infection control okay. and, yeah, many other things. All right. Um, we, we have to apologize for we having some technical issues with our sound. We're going to go for a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion. Please stay with us. Nothing else can replace Just your slightest embrace And if you only would Be my own All the rest of my day I will whisper this phrase My darling Ceci Pom Yes, yes.
Sports Live every Saturday and Sunday at 7:30 p.m. A warm welcome to one of your favorite weekly review analysis programs, Media Monitor. So let's look at the race itself. It's just becoming a personality contest where people just want somebody to guard their own vested interest. And I feel that the country's at a point now where we need some sort of change. It is ANC policy that they will have to implement. We fairly know the direction the ANC wants to take. As a leader, you have to implement. So what was it like on the ground in Kenya? Well, the country is divided. The country is very divided. I think within the country for me, the one person that I criticize severely and I'm not very happy with his approach is Raila Odinga with him pulling out. Stay tuned to Media Monitor and catch on analysts unpacking top stories every Sunday from 9 a.m. Okay, welcome back and apologies for the technical issues that we had. We continue our story on a TB. And with me in the studio, first up is Dr. Jafet Manda, who's a specialist physician from Butsilo Clinic. Dr. Norbert Njega, who's the um, uh, director of MDR TB from uh, National Department of Health. We're now joined by another special guest, Fazila Fares. Now, Fazila is the Occupational Health and Safety Spokesperson from Hospice. So welcome to Health Talk, uh, Thank you very Fazila. much for having us. All right. I'm going to come back to you now because I'd like us to talk a little more about, you know, healthcare workers. But let's, let's come back to you, Dr. Manda. Um, the clinical features, basically, how do, how do people know that they have TB? Okay. TB is uh, mainly a respiratory tract infection, meaning right. it affects your lungs. Right. Most of the symptoms that people present to, to the hospital are because of that. Mm. Mainly people present with uh, a cough, that has persisted for two to three weeks. In that case, you seek medical attention. The cough may be a dry cough, but most times it's productive. You produce sputum. And the sputum is often associated with a, a, a blood uh, production. Right. Other than that, the person with TB who have what we call constitutional symptoms. By constitutional symptoms, we mean other than the cough that I mentioned could be productive, these people notice that they're starting to lose appetite, mm. they lose weight, and they will give a history that in the evening, they have evening sweat, mm. and at night, they have drenching night sweats. Okay. But is that standard, though? Can, is everybody with TB, I mean, do they go through all of these things that you described? No, right. not everyone with TB coughs, and not everyone who coughs has TB. Mm. So it's yes. kind of complicated. Okay, so, 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 so in terms of, uh, you know, causes and risk factors, you know, um, who's at more risk of contracting TB? Almost everyone is at risk of contracting TB because right. TB is an airborne disease. Right. It's out there in the atmosphere. Right. But then there are certain specific uh, groups that are vulnerable right. than the general uh, population. Okay. Of these groups, the number one would be patients that have got HIV. Mm -hmm. Because their immunity is waning, they are more predisposed to having TB. Mm -hmm. Patients that have got diabetes are also at risk of developing uh, TB. Patients that are on cancer treatment, because those treatments are strong and they suppress your immunity. Right. People that are taking uh, steroids, for whatever reason, are yeah. also a predisposed uh, group. Yeah. And uh, to mention also, people that work in confined spaces, right. minors, yeah. and last but not the least, healthcare workers. Talk about healthcare workers. We have Fazila here. Fazila, just give us a sense of what it is like to be a health worker, healthcare worker in terms of risk for contracting TB. Okay, well, firstly, I'm not a healthcare worker, but right. I do work with many uh, healthcare workers. We right. represent around 68,000 healthcare workers. Mm. And TB is the number one occupational risk in the health sector at present, mainly because there aren't any policies that are in place that are being implemented to protect the healthcare workers. Mm. We also know that the uh, environment in the health sector is overcrowded. There's staff shortages, so the short staff work longer hours. Uh, we also don't know, we don't have an occupational health service that is standard and accessible to all health workers. So we don't know how many of our health workers are in fact HIV infected, 
how many are diabetic, and all of these factors places an increased risk of contracting TB mm. at the workplace. Mm. Okay, perhaps let's get it from the horse's mouth. We have a young doctor who contracted TB um, you know, during the course of her duties, perhaps earlier, just before she qualified. And she joins us from our health, our Devon studios. And this is Dr. Zolelo. Dr. Zolelo, welcome to Health Talk. Dr. Sifumba. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Right. Just, just tell us your story briefly. You contracted TB during the course of your duties. Just tell us how it happened. Yes, so uh, it happened when I was studying, actually. I was in my fourth year at the University of Cape Town. Um, so, yeah, basically I woke up one morning and I had a lump on my neck. Um, I had no idea what was going on. Um, and me and my friends couldn't resist the, the fun of trying to diagnose, you know, what I had. Anyway, a few days later it grew. Um, it was just above my clavicle on this side. A few days later it grew, it got more painful. So I thought, okay, let me go get it checked out. So yeah, went to the hospital, got it checked out. Um, and immediately the doctor that saw me thought it looked like TB. Um, and I was, I mean, I think I disregarded it. I was just like, no, okay, no, I can't get TB, you know? Mm. So anyway, um, some tests were done and the results came back and it actually came out that I had TB. Mm. Um, so honestly, I was in shock um, because, yeah, I, I didn't think we, I mean, TB is a patient's problem. So we as healthcare workers thought, no, it doesn't affect us. You know, surely it affects those people. And when we hear the stats, we hear low SCS, um, we hear, no, they live in a one-bedroom apartment with 10 people, overcrowding, HIV positive. So I thought, okay, look, all of these things aren't me, you know, without, of course, realizing that TB is an airborne disease. So as long as we breathe, we're at risk of getting TB. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are high-risk groups, but as long as we breathe, we can get TB. So basically, it's all our problem because we all breathe. Anyway, um, then I got a phone call a few days later telling me that I actually had MDR-TB and that I had to report to the clinic to take a different regimen of treatment. And I had no idea how hard that regimen was going to be. But anyway, I went to the clinic. Um, they put 20 tablets on the table and said I should take them. Um, I felt nauseous afterwards. And on my way out, they were like, no, come back. There's an injection. Um, yeah, and this yep. injection... It honestly, the way I describe it usually is it feels like hot lava is being injected into you and the pain doesn't go away. So this is six months of that injection mm. and the regimen is 18 to 24 months of those pills. So you can imagine the pain from the injection, the hardship of taking the treatment because every day from then on, I was nauseous, I was vomiting, I had diarrhea, I had joint pain. You know, other people that have been on TB treatment can tell you that the treatment is honestly so horrible to take. And that is why it makes sense that people are stopping their treatment because mm. you can't expect a person to take treatment that's actually making them sick, that's preventing them mm. from providing for their family. It's preventing them from going to work and providing for their children. It, it prevented me from continuing with school, which was my occupation. So the crazy thing is that I contracted TB from being at a hospital, which is mm. not a place that you think, okay, you know, you, you go to the hospital to get treated for disease. You don't go to get a disease. So yeah. if healthcare workers and other staff at the hospital as well, I'm talking about security guards, nurses, everyone, if yeah. we are at risk, that means the general population is at risk, which... All right. Honestly, is a problem. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to so come back to you now, yeah. uh, uh, Dr. Safumba. Let's just take Bonola on the line from Pretoria. Bonola, welcome to Health Talk. Thank you very much for having me. Right. Uh, I have a question because I'm a healthcare worker, yeah. and then I work for a private sector hospital. So in 2016 October, I was diagnosed with the pulmonary tuberculosis, and I immediately started my T my TB treatment, my refurfo. So I was hospitalized for about a week and discharged, and then my physician gave me three weeks of sick leave and then said I was fit to go back to work. My employer at that time 
said, according to their TB, occupational TB policy, I cannot return to work until my gene expect uh, are non-sensitive for the TB um, bacteria. Okay. So as a result, I was asked to stay at home by my employer, even when my physician said I was fit to go back to work because I had no other signs like coughing yeah. and I was already on treatment. So I stayed at home. I exhausted my sick leave and then my employer forced me to take my annual leave as a result right. because I had and no sick you, leave anymore. And so you felt that, was, that asked, was a little unfair, yeah? Yes, okay. because on, during that process, they also asked me if the doctor can extend my, my sick leave, but the doctor was persistent saying, you know, this person is fit to go to All right. work. Let's, uh, thank you, thank you very much, leave. Bonono. Let's, let's try and get a response, perhaps firstly from the doctor's side in terms of when it is safe for anybody to go back to work after having started TB treatment. Okay. Ideally, everyone who's uh, rightfully diagnosed and started on TB treatment, here I'm talking about drug-sensitive uh, TB. Usually when they take their medication, for two weeks to three weeks, they become non-infectious. And what I would have expected is that... Uh, after two weeks, someone should be energetic enough to report back uh, to, to, to their work. Obviously, this is not absolute. Some patients take a bit longer to get, uh, to get better, and that is a decree of the attending physician. Okay. Let me, let me get a, a, a comment from the department side. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you have a few, you know, uh, uh, words to say in terms of what Hospesa was saying. And secondly, in terms of, you know, looking at this question of saying, here we are, we have healthcare workers whose duty it is to take care of people that are infected with all sorts of illnesses, obviously including TB. What is it that we're not doing right to protect these workers? Yeah, thank you so much. I think the, the, the question of uh, protecting healthcare workers is, is, is critical. Uh, but uh, I think overall, uh, prevention we've not been doing very well. It's not just about healthcare workers. Maybe just my first comment will be uh, to the colleague that has spoken just now is to say that uh, 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 she need to discuss with uh, 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 employers or even a treating physician. The TB space is moving very fast mm. and a lot of our colleagues have remained behind. We need to make sure that information uh, reaches people. I think that's also something we're discussing internally within government. Gene expert is good for diagnosis. It's molecular diagnosis. You need it for quick diagnosis, mm. but you can't use it to, to measure response to treatment. Mm. It has to be the, the ordinary TB culture yeah. that you've been doing, yeah. but then also patients that are smear negative are less yeah. infectious than those that are positive. Okay. In terms of OSPESA, there have been discussion, robust discussion, and civil society was uh, part of it. There is a draft policy that is to be um, you know, reviewed and endorsed by the National Health Council sometimes, maybe this month or next month, okay. but there is discussion around it. I agree there have not been much effort in terms of prevention overall, and, and that is something that we are okay. looking at it very seriously. Okay, I'm going to ask for your comments, but we now have to go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, please, I'm going to ask you to, to just respond to some of those things, mainly talking around the issue of prevention. Okay, time for a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion on prevention of tube TB. Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill, we'll help you stay well. Let's cross over live to Criselda Lewis, who is standing by at the arbitration hearings. But I didn't think about it at the time that people could be dying. Let's update your sports news.
Get all the dominating stories locally and globally on Newsroom every Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. A warm welcome to one of your favorite weekly review analysis programs, Media Monitor. So let's look at the race itself. It's just becoming a personality contest where people just want somebody to guard their own vested interest. And I feel that the country is at a point now where we need some sort of change. It is ANC policy that they will have to implement. We fairly know the direction the ANC wants to take. As a leader, you have to implement. So what was it like on the ground in Kenya? Well, the country is divided. It, the country is very divided. I think within the country for me, the one person that I criticize severely and I'm not very happy with this approach is Raila Odinga with him pulling out. Stay tuned to Media Monitor and catch on analysts unpacking top stories every Sunday from 9 a.m. Welcome back. We're talking TB, and if you've just joined us, thank you so much. And um, yeah, we have our guests here. First up, Dr. Jaffed uh, from um, Batsila Hospital in Pretoria. And we have Dr. Tandi from Right to Care, and of course, Fazil Affairs from um, um, Hospesa. Okay, before we continue our discussion, we have a call on the line, and this is Binati from Cape Town. Binati, welcome to Health Talk. Benata, are you there? She's not there. Okay. And of course, in our Devon studios, we still, we still have Dr. Zarela Sifumba, who's an MDRTB survivor as a healthcare worker. Let me give this opportunity to you to start off. Uh, perhaps you want to comment around the issues of, we, we're talking obviously prevention now. If you're looking at what's happening to healthcare workers, I think we've covered the issue around, you know, the risk that they're exposed to. What is it that we should be doing right to protect healthcare workers against TB? Well, firstly, healthcare workers have a right to protection in terms of the hazardous biological agents regulations, right. which means that every employer employing healthcare workers must have an occupational health program in place. They must do regular hazard and risk inspections to assess which sectors of that particular health facility, which workers are more at risk. Hmm. They are must you saying that's not happening currently? No, it's not happening. I can confirm that because the Department of Labor in 2015 uh, assessed about 407 health facilities and confirmed that 22% were compliant with the HBA regulations. Mm. We also know that the Department of Labor has issued the National Department of Health with a Section 7 instruction uh, requesting that they develop a policy and a strategy to protect health workers. Mm. And this has not been done. Right. Hospersa has met with the DG on the 3rd of October 2017 and promises were made, but uh, as Dr. Njeka says, the policy is yet to be uh, put in place. All right. I believe we have Binati on the line. Binati, welcome. Um, hi. I, I was affected with TB last year. Yes. Then I took my medication. It took for seven months. Right. And then after that, I got tested for my last few term, and then my results came negative. So after that, they gave me another six months treatment, right. which is they said it's for preventing you from getting TB again. Okay. And you so want to know? I want to understand. Yes. I want to understand if is it a must for me to continue taking the six month treatment or what? All right. Let's give it to the doctors to. To respond who wants to take it All right yeah. um that's a bit unusual in the sense that uh, the first seven months that she's talking about I, I i i'm a bit familiar with it because sometimes in patients that have got uh, sputum positive tb we treat them for the intensive phase for for two months at the end of two months we can test for uh, the presence of the bacteria yeah. if it's still positive we continue for an extra month in the intensive phase, and after that, we give them the remaining four months. That All would right. add up to, to, seven, to seven months. All right. Let's come Certain back people to, yeah, sorry, that yeah. have got uh, extra pulmonary TB, meaning TB outside of the lung, we may prolong the treatment, yeah. usually nine to 12 months. But in this case, she had 
sputum that is negative, negative. she was told, okay, you need to take treatment to prevent it, you know, prevent I'm, yourself I'm, from I'm, spreading it. I'm not familiar with that uh, right. scenario. It's a bit unusual, isn't it's it? It's unusual. All right. Let's hear from Dr. Tandy. Let's come back to the issue of prevention. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in your work around, especially MDR-TB, mm -hmm. you've heard what Hospesa is saying. What are your thoughts on how we can prevent TB, especially amongst the healthcare workers? Yes. So prevention of TB, like it's been said, it's an airborne disease. So the risk, it's everybody's at risk. So the best thing is reduce the infectious pool, which mm. is airborne. Mm. So the best method is actually to identify the patients mm. that possibly have TB as early and diagnose them as early as possible mm. with the right uh, uh, tests. We've got a test now that is called GeneXpert that can not only diagnose that you've got TB mm. in two hours' time, it can also detect whether you've got resistance to the potent drug that we use to treat normal TB. Yeah. Sure, and surely that's, uh, that's not an easy one, isn't it? Firstly, finding the people to mm -hmm. screen mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the issue of who's got access to um, the gene expert technology that you spoke about. We're going to come back to that. Let, let me just invite a comment from our Devon studios, uh, Dr. Zolola Sifumba. Dr. Sifumba, I'm sure you, you have some thoughts on what is it that can be done to prevent TB, especially from affecting healthcare workers. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to mention that it's not just the healthcare workers that are at risk. So it's right. the nurses, it's the cleaning staff, meaning it's also the patients, which is why this is very important. So I think, number one, we need to educate. And that's what I do, what I do. So educating the public, educating healthcare workers that we are actually at increased risk and we need to protect ourselves from that. Mm. And that, for me, is also a call to other healthcare workers that have contracted TB to speak up and tell their story so that the rest of us can know that we are actually at risk and we need to protect ourselves. Mm. And the second thing I think needs to be done is called IPC, which is Infection Prevention and Control, which is basically finding a way to eliminate or reduce the exposure within the hospital. So that could be extractor fans, that could be just making sure that there's a current running through, meaning open windows, that it, 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 it needs engineering um, within the specific healthcare settings to actually make methods to decrease our exposure to the TB because TB comes in form of a coughing person and we don't know if you've got the flu, we don't know if you've got heart failure, we don't know what it is until we actually look into the symptoms and test you for TB. So we just need to always be alert and, 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 and be alert of our risk and the fact that this person may have TB. All right, okay. Let's take Lumi on the line from the Western Cape. Lumi, welcome to Health Talk. Hi, I'm going to talk to you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. What she's basically asking, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard, um, is, is it possible that uh, when somebody gets checked for TB, uh, they say to her, there are no signs that you have TB, but we are going to give you, nevertheless, medication for TB. Yes, that is not uh, an extraordinary scenario. The way we diagnose TB falls under two categories. Mm. There is definitive TB diagnosis, in which case someone gives us sputum and we send it to the laboratory. The laboratory tells us, yes, they found TB. So there, that is a definite diagnosis. But then there's also a group of people which is usually the majority. Mm. They come with symptoms of TB. They've been coughing. They are losing weight. Maybe they have a relative who has got uh, uh, TB. We do the, 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 the sputum check, and it's negative. But in the doctor's opinion, the person fulfills the symptomatology of TB. Right. In that case, right. we will still go ahead so, and put them on treatment. Okay, so the message, it is possible, and if the person has been advised to take tre treatment, they should go you ahead. please go ahead and take treatment. Yes. Okay, let's have a, that's a sh subject in the last two minutes. Now, we said that it's, it's obviously difficult in that, you know, by the time people present with symptoms, you know, for treatment, they've already spread this infectious bug. What can be done to increase our efforts in trying to get these people, screening them a little early on before it's too late. Your thoughts on that? Yes. Um, 
You know, the education has, has, has been mentioned, people being aware of the symptoms and presenting early and being treated and starting treatment early and sticking to the treatment. The other thing as well is people present to facilities for unrelated things. So facilities, you know, you know we're being encouraged to screen all people that visit facilities. You ask them four questions about TB, and then if they are positive to one of them, they are taken to, to, for testing for TB. Mm. So screening of everyone, even if you've just broken your leg right. and you present to the clinic, you should be asked, or even the hospital, but it, it's, it's happening differentially. It's not happening, you know, all the time. Okay. You know, not everyone is doing it, but it should be done. Okay. What about the idea of a TB vaccine? Um... Mm. When it comes to a TB vaccine, currently what we have is a BCG. Right. And every, every, every mother especially is aware to the fact that all children under five yeah. get a BCG yeah, But uh, the effectiveness vaccine. long term? Um, it is effective in the sense that although it cannot prevent a child from uh, contracting TB, if they were to contract TB, the symptoms wouldn't be as fair and there would be lesser complications. Mm. So it does not absolutely uh, make someone immune to contracting uh, TB. Right. Okay. Fazila, I'm going to give you the last 30 seconds. Your last words on prevention of TB among healthcare workers. Yes, the uh, health department must come up with the guidelines. They must come up with the policy. And every healthcare worker must have access at their place of work to okay. training and screening and testing. And the worst part is that people like Solekna and others who contract TB, TB is an occupational disease. Mm. And employers must stop asking healthcare workers where they contracted the TB from yeah. and get busy. They should not be taking their sick leave. They have access to leave in terms of the compensation okay. fund. Fazel Affairs from Hospesa, thank you so much for your time. Okay, okay. time for another quick break. When we come back, we talk treatment of TB. Please stay with us. If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. MedShield, embracing our members in good health since 1968. At MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. MedShield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill, we'll help you stay well. If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. MedShield. Embracing our members in good health since 1968. MedShield. Embracing our members in good health since 1968. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. SABCnews.com is your one-stop digital portal to all the news you need. With a website that is easy to use on mobile, SABC News prides itself in being the primary source of public service content across multiple platforms. Watch live streams of all the big news events on the SABC News YouTube channel, which is one of the most viewed South African YouTube channels globally. And catch up on the best of SABC television and radio news. Follow breaking news on all of the SABC News social media platforms Interact with SABC News on Facebook and stay connected on Twitter for the latest headlines and real-time updates by our reporters. SABC News, everywhere. Okay, welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. We still have our guests uh, up here in Jobek. Um, we have Dr. Jafet Manda, um, specialist physician from uh, Pretoria. We have Dr. Tandi Jaminimiti uh, from uh, Right to Care and of course Dr. Norbert Njega from the National Department of Health. In our Devon studios, we still have Dr. Sifumba. Now, perhaps let's start there in Devon. 
And uh, just kind of wrap up now, um, in terms of uh, perhaps your last words on prevention of TB amongst healthcare workers, Dr. Sfumba. Um, so I just want people to know that as long as you breathe, you're at risk of contracting TB. Right. It's not a thing of HIV positive or negative. It's not a thing of skin color. It has nothing to do with anything else but the fact that we breathe, meaning this is all of our problem. It's not something that just us as healthcare workers or the government or the policymakers, we need everyone to get on board and realize that actually this is our problem and we need to solve it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for those wise words. And um, let's get back to our, our Johannesburg studio and, and, and perhaps finish up. I mean, during our break, Dr. Tan, you mentioned something about, you know, the fact about HIV. I mean, we've spent quite a bit of time only talking about, you know, TB. But in HIV-infected patients, prevention of TB. Your thoughts on that? Yes, I think it's, it's, it's very critical that we talk about, you know, uh, prevention in HIV-infected people. Right. HIV-infected people actually have got 50 times the risk of a non-HIV-infected person mm. of acquiring TB. And TB is what kills most uh, people with HIV. Mm. So it's very important that uh, they are started on antiretroviral therapy quickly so that their CD4, you know, count and, you know, goes up. Their immune system is built up. Uh, uh, you know, and suppress that viral that that virus. Mm. And the other thing is, well, since it's airborne uh, uh, TB, we also have a program that all HIV patients should either uh, be on you know be on TB treatment if they've been screened and found not to have TB, then the, we, they should be on preventive therapy. Mm. Uh, at, currently, we have isoniazide preventive therapy, what we call IPT, and it's really uh, uh, mandatory that, you know, they should be on this for a minimum of 12 months, mm. those who are on, uh, taking art. Is it only uh, HIV-infected mm. individuals who, who are supposed to be on this IPT? Not, uh, not necessarily. Uh, remember the group of people that I said were high-risk mm. people. And these people, we can put them on... Uh, usually we are using... Um, isoniazide, in uh, rare cases, we use uh, rifampicin. Mm. These are people that we call to have latent TB, mm. but in special, in, in special groups. She has alluded already to HIV mm. patients. Of course, one cardinal thing is that if you've got such a patient, you have to make sure you screen them for active TB, right. or else you'll be, you, you, you be sub- uh, adequately be treating uh, TB. All right. Dr. Jack, we spoke earlier about, you know, obviously the importance of treating contacts, you know, these high-risk uh, uh, individuals. But the issue is how to get them. What, what is done by government, let's, let's say, by the department, obviously, in trying to address this problem? Yeah, it, that, that's a very important uh, area of our work. We, we estimate uh, approximately 134,000 missing cases. These are people who have tuberculosis and are probably, uh, and are not on treatment, mm -hmm. probably not diagnosed, sometimes diagnosed, not initiated on treatment. Because I was saying earlier on that we treat approximately 300,000 active TB in a year, but then we miss uh, that other uh, number. So what we're doing really, we're revising our policy and very soon we'll start, uh, uh, you know, to, to put a new, uh, implement a new policy. We're thinking that uh, screening with these four questions and only test when they have uh, symptoms is mm. probably a bit of a challenge. Nothing wrong with it. The whole world does it, but we feel that because we are such a high burden country, we should start with treating those at high risk. For example, a pregnant woman you know, uh, you should test instead of just screening, you know, you're, you're HIV positive. The, the risk to develop TB if you're HIV positive is 10% per year. If you're HIV negative, it's 10% lifetime. Now, that's so big difference. So such people should just be tested. Mm -hmm. More so that we heard from our physician that uh, some people don't have symptoms and they present with tuberculosis mm -hmm. at latest. So, so these are some of the new things that, uh, that we are planning from the department. Uh, so it, it means massive testing. We also 
doing a TB prevalence survey. We done KwaZulu Natal, we moved to Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. that, that will give us the real picture because we've never had a TB prevalence survey in South Africa. We now know exactly how many TB patients we have in the country at any given time. So okay. I think that's what we're planning on ourselves. So obviously here we're talking about TB treatment. And I'm, and I'm sure, I mean, we've touched on it a few times. Um, we, t we spoke about the principles of, of treatment. Just take us through very briefly, um, who gets treatment for how long? All right. Uh, it's very important to establish the fact that TB is treatable. Yes. And armed with that information, everyone who's diagnosed with TB should ensure that they get adequate treatment. Right. The treatment can be long, yes, but this is a treatable disease. Right. In basic terms, TB treatment is divided into two phases. The first one called intensive phase, and the second phase is a continuation phase. Mm. The intensive phase lasts uh, two months, and during this phase, someone is put on four different types of uh, TB medication. Mm. I'll come back to that later. Then in the continuation phase, the person is put on two of the backbone treatment uh, drugs for, for TB. Mm. The reason why TB treatment involves this combination of medication is the TB bacteria, once it's inside someone, mm. it is in va various forms. Some of it is sleeping dormant. Some of it is multiplying. Some of it is busy trying to infect other, other cells. So we want to catch all these bags of TB at a go. And the, in, the intensive phase, which is two months, is meant at first and foremost to try to kill as much of the bacteria in someone as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the continuation phase is mainly meant to reduce uh, emergence of mutant uh, TB, mm -hmm. which are drug-resistant TB, mm -hmm. and then to continue to sterilize uh, the bacteria that someone okay. has. All right. Unfortunately, our time is up. I was going to give you uh, 10 seconds, but unfortunately, we, we don't have that time. Um, well, there was uh, in the middle Dr. Tandil Laminimiti uh, from Right to Care, closer to me, Dr. Jafta Amanda, specialist physician from Pretoria, and Dr. Nobet Njeka from the National Department of Health. And of course, in our Devon studios, we had um, uh, Dr. Sifumba. So that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for staying with us. We're we'll back on the screens in a week's time, same time, same place. I'm Dr. Salomon Daung, and until next time, please do take care.